You're better than, well, thank, thanks, uh, thanks for coming. Um, so I'm going to just get into a little bit of an introduction and then we'll jump right in. We usually stop right at 12.30. I like to keep it nice and tight, but you know, we'll just have a nice informal conversation about the easy to understand topic of open banking. Great. Now let me just see if I can get past my technical impediments here. There we go. Sometimes these work properly, sometimes they don't. Uh, yeah, I'd like to say uh, welcome everyone to our uh, Masters of Financial Innovation and Technology uh, webinar. I'm Ryan Reardon. I'm not the reason you're here though, because I've been here for the last uh, at least 12 sessions. But uh, just a little bit of a background. I'm a professor of finance at the Smith School of Business. I'm the director of this program, the Masters of Financial Innovation and Technology and also the Director of Research for the Institute of Sustainable Finance. Actually, it's the Institute for Sustainable Finance. I always correct people and then I forget myself. Um, so uh, today I have, uh, a, uh, um, I would say, an illustrious guest with us, uh, guest with us, the member of our advisory board. We've got Rob Patterson. He's uh, uh, Alterna's president and C CEO since 2013. You bring uh, a focus for customer experience. The reason we're here today is also the passion for fintech, a global understanding of the financial services industry. You, know, you and I have had lots of conversations about a, a number of things that we could probably go way off topic, but we'll, we'll try not to. You've um, led a number of institutions in, in strategic roles at CIBC, JP Morgan Chase, uh, McKinsey, and Aon. Um, you've worked in retail, small business, commercial banking, you're a pioneer in the emerging digital payments technology lending solutions. Uh, you're a mentor to students in our program, but also to this as a fledgling program as well. You're a director of the Cooperators Group, Payments Canada, who we just finished a great uh, crypto economics session with a couple of weeks ago, Central One, Alterna Bank. Uh, this is the, I guess, the one black mark on your record. You're on the advisory board of the University of Western Ontario's Art School. Although I, I should say, I grew up in London because my parents went to uh, undergraduate and graduate school at, at Western, but you know, that's okay. You're on the Dean's Advisory Board at Sprott School of Business. I went there as, a, as an undergraduate. And you're on the Advisory Board of the Masters of Financial Innovation and Technology at Queen's. So uh, Rob, welcome to, uh, to our little webinar. Thanks, Ryan. Good to be here. The, the last Description was clearly the best, right? The the the, the MFIT program. Exactly. You you always you always end up with you know the most important part of what you're doing because it bridges right over. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and we wanted to talk about uh, amongst other things, uh, open banking. We wanted to talk about open banking in Canada. We wanted to talk about open banking globally. We can talk about data portability. We can talk about what's going wrong. We can talk about what's going right. Why don't we start with, uh, I'd say, a simple question. What is open banking? And why should we, either as people that are going to move into industry, but also as clients, why should we care about open banking? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I'll always try and put it in very simple terms, right? Because it's, it is a topic that, um, you know, people believe to be a, a bit more complex than it, than it actually has, has to be. In its simplicity, it is kind of a revolution or an evolution for the everyday consumer, where you're getting to gain back your power of ownership of your data, your financial data as it exists, the types of things that you're buying on your credit card, your credit score, your, the information uh, about your holdings, uh, about the performance of those holdings, the interest rates on those holdings, terms and conditions of those holdings. Today, they reside at financial institutions in Canada and they are not connected. And there is no simple and easy way to get access to that information. The best you can hope for is the FI that you're dealing with gives you some simple tools or capabilities to do some analysis of the information that they have at their institution. It's often stale dated, it's, it's, it's not real time, it doesn't have advisory analysis around it. Um, and it's biased, right? Because it's coming from the institution that wants to retain that, doesn't want to point out you're not making what you should necessarily make, wants to maybe cover up a few of the fees that, you know, are being charged here and there. And, and sure as heck doesn't want to benchmark it, right? Um, against peers in, in the industry. 
So open banking is going to empower us and give us the capability to, to get access to that information. It's going to be an equalizer that will actually treat every Canadian uh, the same way. It's going to empower and assist the underserved and the underbanked in the country by giving them equal access uh, to information by removing biases uh, from information and pointing out those biases in, in, that, that exist. And if you look at Canada as a melting pot, you know, or, or however you want to describe how we have grown, you know, other than Indigenous people, all of us have come from other countries. When we came, we had to cut off our banking relationships with those other countries and shift and move and drop into to Canada. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm an immigrant. I, I, didn't, I wasn't born in Canada. I, I came to Canada from Hong Kong. I was born in Paris, France. I've lived around the world. Open banking is going to allow us to port our, our history, our, our, our credit worthiness, our, our stay connected to data that is in those other countries so that we can, again, build our capability up, our knowledge up, and who we are. Um, so as we inbound into different countries, uh, we're not going to come in as an unknown, as an unproven. We're going to be able to say, I own all my data and let me show you all the years of my banking that I had in France and China and you know, Singapore and everywhere else that I came to and port that with me um, as something I own. So that, you know, in a simple form, it, it, it's, you know, again, a revolution, evolution, however you want to put it, but it's going to empower us as individuals. It's going to be an equalizer and providing greater equality and access to financial services. And, you know, I guess the last thing, it's going to be a catalyst for the creation of new companies, new entities, new organizations. So it's going to increase employment. It's going to increase competitiveness. And you're seeing that, you know, we often call it fintechs or insurtechs, right, coming out into the space. It's allowing those individuals that don't have to have all the regulatory and go through the the, the, the norms of the financial service to create new services in new ways for us as consumers to action that data and to be an honest broker, potentially give us better advice as we go forward. So hopefully that's as simple as we can distill it down, but that's that's kind of it. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, as simple as we can get with a topic like this. Let, let me try to be a little bit of a naive pessimist. So it, it sounds like, or, or if I was to explain this to my mother-in-law, who speaking of immigrants happens to be here from Germany right now, and my, my wife was born in Germany. If I was to explain to her open banking, I said, well, then there's this, you know, there's this digital thing on your laptop that has all of your financial information. Do we have privacy issues? Are there risks associated with it? And are those risks smaller than the benefits or the rewards that we're going to get from bringing all of this, this information together in one repository? You know, because it, 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 you have to remember right today, there is risk in everything we do. Having all of your information at, say, one of the big five banks, it has risk. You know, there no financial institution anywhere in the world can tell you they aren't going to be hacked. And as you take a look around, you know, we, we're all aware of the one that happened at Desjardins a couple of years ago where it was a rogue employee. It wasn't even an external attack into the data. It was a rogue employee that seemed to be unhappy with life at that time. And they had access to data and they uploaded it to to be, you know, who they wanted to be on that day, the best person that, on that day. So, you know, the, the the rules around data privacy, the rules around data storage, they're there to protect us. Right. And we we make informed choices about how we store data, how we we present data. So I, I don't see it as a higher risk. I, I see actually open banking letting us understand the risk and make appropriate decisions about how we want to move the information. Canada still has a very strong data framework for fintechs, for other organizations. We are looking for the government to give greater legislation, you know, and controls around data privacy, around data cert certification. So that is going to be there to help it. But no, I don't, I don't see it as a heightened risk at all uh, in, in how we, we go forward. I know some people do. I respect that, that they, they feel that way, but at the end of the day, it's it's again one of those things that if I pick up a USB key that I find, you know, on the on the floor outside and I plug it into my computer, the risk of what just happened there is on me, right? And you know, for those that don't know, that's what 
a lot of fishers do and fraudsters do. They they actually encrypt something on the USB. They throw it out on the street. They leave it at airports, coffee shops with the hope that you come in and plug it in and say, hey, I wonder what's on here. And then they take over your 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 notebook. So um, at the end of the day, you know, we have to be appropriate citizens when we're, we're dealing with our data and with our our um, our equipment. Yeah, certainly a big risk of uh, the financial institutions are the only ones with my data is that they're going to make me offers for products that I don't need at prices that are uncompetitive. Well, you know, if you take a look, I always love to look at savings accounts. Um, if you go on to Rate Hub or any of the, the aggregator sites and you say, let's just look at the names that, um, uh, you know, are used. You know, I, 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 you know, one of the big five, you know, they have a bonus interest rate savings account, an advantage savings account, an E savings account, an unlimited, you know, savings account. They have all these great marketing names and then you take a look at the rates and they can be anything today from zero to you know maybe 20 basis points and 30 basis points so you can't rely on the marketing uh from an institution to be transparent accurate um or 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 or, or in your best interest right they're trying to get your eyeballs hoping you aren't going to shop around and you know hoping you will take their product or service so when you think of you know open banking in, in, in the ways in China today, there's several you know fintechs that have come up that are using uh, applications they've developed where you put in how much money you have liquid, you talk answer some questions about you know how when will you need access for it, how much of it will you need access for it over the next 30, 60, 90 a year. They then will actually manage it through the FIs you trust. So they say which ones do you have relationships with. And you can say, yep, this one, this one, this one, here are my five. They will then optimize that for you, moving money in and out of those accounts to maximize based on what you're going to need off the cash flow, what you're going to, you know, your the institutions you're dealing with. But they're now even coming back and saying, we know these are the five you like, but FYI, if you'd accepted these other two, we would have been able to give you this much of an increase in your earnings. Your profit. So they're using that kind of open banking API capability to be the honest broker. And, and they're, they're transparent. They're saying, look, we take X basis points as our fee. So, you know, we will manage it for you, but we will, you know, be transparent. Here's what we make. And then our job is just to make you as much as you can within your needs around, around that currency. That's what open banking is going to change from your view of the, you know, the individual institution marketing. And then if I have to actually be the one that goes and says, OK, did, you know, ABC Bank change the rates? Should I move from that account to this account? I think every one of us knows in Canada how difficult it is just sometimes moving money back. We, you know, Payments Canada is doing some amazing work, you know, to get the real time rail rolled out. But as you know, we've been late to the game in Canada, you know, getting getting it deployed um, versus other countries. And you know, it's still, we have a lot of lagging, right? Things take a day or, or two clearing periods. Whereas we're now going to get to the point where that can be an instantaneous live transaction. As soon as I hit it, it's gone. Or as soon as a FinTech and then using APIs executes it, it's instantaneously getting that higher uh, rate on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I didn't want to go into, uh, into the, the sort of the global perspective yet, but we might as, we might as well. So what type of innovations besides the one you just mentioned in in china do you think we could expect to see in canada or what are we missing out on in terms of of fis or products doesn't really matter who they come from that can be built on top of an open banking infrastructure and you know it could be open banking or real-time rails yeah I mean, I mean i think here's the biggest thing the biggest difference that you're seeing in europe and asia is the speed at which that because the fintechs have access into the payment systems, because they have free equality to data and to, to aggregating it, the speed of innovation and advancement of, of, of abilities in those countries to pivot is incredibly strong. And we've seen that through the pandemic and how international countries do it. If you look at Canada, I think the best example that's been used where we lucked out was the CRA of all, all organizations actually had been spending a lot of you know, dollars in improving their digital capabilities. Had they not done that, when the CERB payments came out, you know, and I'm sure yeah. a lot of people have heard about CERB, we wouldn't have been able to get that out because you know, 
even in a year or so prior, that would have been a check, right? That would have been mm -hmm. checks being printed, put into the mail, you know, finding their way through the system to get money into the hand. So, you know, there's the example where, you know, again, with a little bit of the innovation capability, we were able to real time payments and capability into people that have need. But you're really seeing um, the, the fintech market in, in Europe and Asia take off where the ability to give people the added value advice on you know, mortgages, on savings account, on their wealth portfolios, and tying in um, options, solutions, allowing people to do game theory analysis you know, on, on their mortgage, game theory analysis on their, their equity portfolios. Um, uh, you know, people are doing solution sets which allow you to have your, your real portfolio but actually allow you to create mock portfolios that are, well, here's what I would, if I had a little bit more courage, I might've done this mm -hmm. and actually see how those mock portfolios uh, advance. But the, the people say, well, you could probably do some of that here, but the difference is when you decide then to convert some of the mock into the current, here it's paperwork, it's going through things, it's having to get money in. There it's it's fluid, it's real time. It's like, yes, I wanna do it now. I wanna make this trade and it, it seamlessly is moving money from three institutions you had, aggregating it into one to go to the broker to make the purchase off the model you've already built, which is buying from two other institutions and then showing you your net position, you know, within 20 minutes, 15 minutes later. Mm -hmm. That's that's a fundamental difference, right, in, in it here. Here, unfortunately, we're doing a lot of paperwork. We're filling it out to choose this online broker, to choose that one. Um, you know, they only deal with these funds. They won't connect you to those funds. You have to have money already in the account. You, that, that money's going to be kind of dead and sitting there, you know, for, for, for weeks at a time. It pays no interest. That's kind of the Canadian model, right, that we're, we're faced with. Yeah. Canada is, is starting to get it, right, because we have the wealth simples. We've got the cohos and the mogos, right? Those, those are coming in. We're seeing the Quest trades evolve, right, and, and go beyond in, in getting their licenses, but um, we're still lagging, right? The, we, we still don't have full access to the payment system. We still don't have um, the data sharing and, and uh, the, the uh, crypto capabilities to allow for you know, more beyond normal cash currencies, uh, and we still have a fairly conservative you know, model is, you know, for us, we're, 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 you know, we're known as the cannabis banker. And because we're the cannabis banker, that sets off more, you know, you know, concern um, bells at dealing with other FIs. Yeah. Um, so I actually have a question from the, the from the Q&A that I think is actually a pretty good one. It touched on a lot of the points that uh, you just made. So the question came from Patrick uh, Machekara. Uh, how do you think traditional financial institutions are working to improve relationships? And I'd add maybe not improve relationships with third party fintechs. We've seen a couple of acrimonious relationships, Plaid and JP Morgan. Uh, we've seen a lot of them. Cannabis is sort of an example that you made. That's not necessarily a fintech, but um, perhaps financial institutions using their monopoly power over the payment system to, to make it hard to, to innovate. So do you think, the, these relationships are going to change, are changing. Uh, what's your What's your view from the from the real world? Yeah, I mean the real world, and, and I'll, I'll I'll use it more domestically in Canada, right? In Canada, mm -hmm. the big five are trying to kill open banking, right? You know, you can call up Senator Deacon at any time and have a good yeah. coffee talk with 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 him, and and Colin will tell you straight out, right? I mean, the the big five, it's not in their best interest, right? It's an oligopoly in Canada. We have very few institutions that own 90% of the marketplace and they don't want to. They'll do it if they have to, but then they'll also try and figure out how they build up and replicate that technology of the FinTech and they will try and figure out how to limit the FinTech, right? They will look at uh, wanting them to have exclusive relationships. They will look at them and try and figure out how they can take them over, right? They look at, you know, how they can control mm -hmm. them absolutely. So the big five, I don't think are embracing the concept of open banking, right? Which is, yes, you want to have connectivity into those fintechs and really you get to know them, but you're not looking to, to take them over. There's smaller institutions like, you know, the one I run, Alternative Savings, Alternative Bank, 
we are a friend to the fintech space. We have tons of friends in the fintech space because we don't restrict them. We we want them actually to be a catalyst to changing us. We're a 113 year old organization. You know, I'm in my 50s. I have no hair left, right? Like I, you know, we need younger, you know, minds to help us to re-examine the sector. So in Canada, I, I hate to say it, I think we we aren't seeing the big five. Um, be a catalyst to it, which would you know increase employment, would would increase the competitiveness. Not to throw another university in, but if we looked at the University of Waterloo and we looked at where a disproportionate of their talent goes that comes out of the the tech sector, it goes to Silicon Valley, right? Like it goes right across to to California and mm. doesn't come back because they can't get those innovative jobs here. They're 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 much harder to do. But things are changing, and I think. You know, in Canada, we sometimes hold on, you know, we held on to Bell Telephone, right, before we started to have some competition, at least, you know, in, in the phone systems. Um, look at Apple and what Apple did, right? Apple coming in with Apple Pay was probably, in my mind, the, the most, the single biggest disruption of the tech sector into banking, where they went to the big five, even the big five Canadian banks and said, we're going to take a percentage of what you make. Yeah. And we're, we're disintermediating you. It's our device. And you are going to do what we say to connect to us and how you're going to connect to us and how you're going to go forward. And so that's, you know, pretty interesting to see how that has been successful, because I'm sure a lot of you are like me. I carry no cash. I carry this device on the back of it. I have a driver's license in this little sleeve. And I have one credit card because some purchases go over what I can do for Apple Pay. That is the sum total of what I now have. And if I look at this, I don't go and I say, oh, yeah, I'm paying by you know ABC Bank. I sit there and say, you have Apple Pay, right? And I tap. So Apple's completely disrupted. And you know the big five in Canada saw that and said, you know, that first they tried to push back. No, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. We're going to hold. We're going to hold. Let's all link arms and hold. Um, and then what happened? They all started to to crumble and we all have Apple Pay and, and Apple is controlling the terms of how that goes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we are starting to see some disruption in it, right? Yeah. Speaking of game theory, there was a classic prisoner's dilemma. All of them were worried about the first one deviating and then they all decided to deviate from the hold, hold the line. I remember when it happened, I was teaching a fintech class and I said, you know, you should really think of this as like a Trojan horse. Right. Apple's coming in and they're saying, oh, well, you know, at first they're, they're, the, they're the nice guy. We're going to do this. We're going to help. We're going to help facilitate. But slowly, at some point, they're going to have enough power. In fact, they have much more market power to just slowly take over the, the sort of the, the, the payment sphere. So if I was a financial institution, I kept saying, you know, I'd be worried about big tech more than I'd be worried about about fintech because, you know, they could swoop in with cash and buy the entire, you know, the market capitalization of the big five Canadian banks in in cash on their balance sheet so that they're not really worried about competing with you guys correct and and you know even when you look at well simple you look at coho right you look at even flinks out of montreal on the data side right these are great enablers that you know again the the big five will start to lose share at over time right and it will be quiet share because what's happening right now in canada is, is the big five are probably sitting back you know they're in the tops of their large towers right and they're they're looking out and they're saying, no, no, we have 98% share, 97% share. You know, there they are. They're in our database. The problem is for them, they're, they're the slow drip, 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 which will become the Niagara Falls, is that, yes, but those consumers now have a well simple account. Those consumers now have a Coho account. They have an alternative bank, an alternative savings account, right? And they don't see those, and especially in the fintech side, they don't see it showing up in a credit bureau. They don't see it showing up in the data set. Mm -hmm. So as those entities start to deploy more and more services, while well, Simple got into the crypto space, more of, of the consumer's business went there, more of their wallet started to go there quietly. They can't see it, right? They actually should want open banking more than anybody. And I think once they open up and they see the full data set, and where the younger consumer is residing with their balances and their banking, it's gonna be a shocker for them. I, I truly believe it's in the big five's best interest for them to retain their share, to actually be 
you know, supporting open banking and seeing, you know, the, the, the full data set of the consumer. Yeah. Someone that was much smarter than me said something that, you know, financial institutions are like a glacier. Right. And so they see the glaciers that we've got everything. But what they're missing is that everything's melting off of the bottom and going to other places. And at a certain point, it just melts so fast. There's just nothing left. And you're left to talk, you know, atop a mountain without a glacier. Well, so, and, and, and look at the speed of it. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll get uh, you're on the ice and water. So, you know, I'm going to say it's like the iceberg thing. Right. You know, it's small and pointy at the top. But boy, does it go down. You know, Dan Everhart at, at um, Coho. So I met Dan a few years ago in Vancouver, had breakfast when he was just, you know, young and crazy with an idea, right? And I loved meeting him. We'd catch up and we've always stayed in touch through the years. Now Dan has a financial institution with Coho, right? He's got hundreds of thousands of, you know, of, of, of consumers. And that was, you know, if you looked at him though, that, you know, if you went down to Bay Street, they'd say, oh, there's this still this young guy in jeans and, you know, mm -hmm. and you do. Yeah. But do you realize there's like a million customers behind him and he's really running a financial institution now with credit cards, deposits and, and the amount of transactions being processed in a day through Coho cards. Right. It, it, it's it's yeah, yeah, it's and open banking is going to not be initial fuel for the banks, but it's sure as heck going to be fuel for Dan. Yeah. So the question is, he's doing well now with all the regulatory burden. What's going to happen to Dan when that is pulled back and he can really, there's real, there's formula one type fuel in his tank, you know, at, at, at Coho. Um, you know, I think that's pretty impressive. But look, I'm betting on those guys. Like we're, we're part of uh, Portage, right? The mm. single largest, you yeah. know, um, FinTech exactly. fund in Canada. So I own part of Dan through the fund, right? So, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's one of those things that, you know, these are going to be the bets for the future. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. So uh, Rob, we've already run out of time. Uh, I've got a, a couple of questions in the, in the Q and A. I'm just going to throw them out there. You can just give me, you know, one or, or, or two word answers. You know, one, are we really talking about regulation? What has to happen in Canada uh, to, to make open banking. I know we've talked to, to Senator Teakin a number of times about these things, but in one sentence. It, it has to be made a priority put into the House and the legislation has to be passed. It's already written. It has to be passed. Okay. And I should also say you're, you're the master of subtle marketing because you got your Smith bottle up there, but you got your Flinks uh, sticker. You threw slings, uh, Flinks in there. You've got Alternative Bank. And you know, because of your mention of Flinks, someone's asking, what's your thought on the acquisition of Flinks by a big bank? If you don't want to comment on it, you don't have to just. No, look, I, I worry that um, it can kill off, right? If you see Scotiabank, they acquired Tangerine and now there's like no one left from the old, you know, ING Tangerine days there. Yeah. They killed off all the talent. Scotia, you know, did that with, I think, um, uh, you know, their online brokerage they bought. I mean, the mm -hmm. big banks have a tendency to kill you know and not actually give fuel to it if fuel is given to flinks and they continue on they'll be a great competitor to plaid in the marketplace there's brilliant talent there in montreal but if they decide to bring them in and and you know say no no you got to follow our views and our things and yeah you know, then you've just killed your investment but the big five do that time and time again that's good. You know, uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that. There's a couple of really specific questions I'll say to the people asking the questions, then you'll have to perhaps join the program. And the next time we get in, in touch with Rob, you can ask the, the questions. Some of them are about Alterna products and other things. So, Rob, it's been great having you here. Uh, I'm only three minutes over, over time and I've got to hand it off to, to Roshan. So thank you very much. Last words. No, no. Hey, look, it, it's I hope you all educate yourself more on open banking. Hope you, uh, look, you know, go to your MPs and MPPs and push them on the agenda. And Ryan, you went around all my my, my stickers on my notebook, but you didn't talk about Baby Yoda. So I, I'm just, you know, come on. It's it's my son would be really disappointed with me if I didn't talk about about uh, Baby Yoda, you know, so uh, I should. I, I did notice the baby Yoda. I thought maybe, you know, I'd uh, I'd avoid that one. It's sensible. I didn't see some other ones, but. And I'm going to have to take some tips from you on uh, on stealth marketing. It's all it's all good. Hey, everyone, be well and hope everyone's families are good. And uh, Ryan, great seeing you as always. Great. Thanks, Rob. See you again soon. Bye bye. OK, uh, thanks, everyone. Sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. 
Um, we, we did get to some of them. These are uh, relatively, relatively quick. I'm going to hand it off and put you guys in the, I'll say relatively capable hands of Roshan. We'll, we'll see. This will be his first, uh, his, his first uh, session, information session going over the details of the program. So please be patient with him. Ask lots of questions. Uh, and as always, if you have additional questions, then you feel free to follow up with myself or with Roshan or anyone at the uh, sort of on the, on the Smith teams. So with that, Roshan, I will hand it over to you. How about this? I will just start for you, Roshan. And then once you get it solved, you can just jump right on in, okay? So as soon as you get it solved, Roshan, you can just uh, you, you can just join. So uh, welcome everyone back. Here I am again. You know, I, I hope you guys didn't miss me. Uh, you know, I, I'll walk you through some of the slides in a little bit of the introduction to the program. I should say that we've got a next intake coming on November 1st and we are pretty much full. Uh, when I say pretty much full is we're already uh, at capacity, over capacity, sort of a, a, a above target. So um, we're, we're mostly recruiting for uh, 2022 and not for the 2021 intake. With that said, you know, if you're an outstanding candidate, you know, you're sort of the top of your class and everything, and there's just no way that we'd want to miss you in the program, feel free to apply. But just in general, we're pretty much, uh, we're, we're pretty much full. Um, so Smith, if you haven't heard of us or the, or the, the uh, Queen School of Business, we've been educating for over a century. So I always like to say that Queens was a university before Canada was a country. And so uh, FinTech is relatively new, but Smith is not relatively new and Queens is even less new. So we'll be here even when FinTech isn't a thing anymore. The program is a first of its kind. So this was the first financial technology master's program uh, that was launched uh, certainly in North America and perhaps simultaneously with some uh, in, in Europe, but it certainly still is a, a sort of a one of a kind. Um, some of the testimonials that we can walk through is that uh, employers today are looking for people who speak the language of business, but also speak the language of technology. So people that know um, how to put together a business model, but also know how to develop the technology for it. And in financial context, these are people that uh, know how to price a loan or price a stock or price an option, but also know how to code up the sort of the fundamentals of data science and machine learning, collect the data, estimate a model, understand the model, visualize it. Uh, and so with these changes in financial technology, blockchain technologies in the crypto space, um, the way investing is happening in an automated fashion, digital capital markets, which is you know, the, the focus of my research, these are the kind of skills that employers are, are, are looking for. Someone who really understands the nitty gritty of finance and the nitty gritty, including implementation of, uh, of analytics, data science, and even just simple automation tasks. Uh, Jennifer Reynolds, who was on with us, I think it was a month ago, um, uh, sort of echoed the same things that we were just talking about. Um, the pace of technology change in financial services has never been greater. The need for talent that can help accelerate innovation is critical. And, you know, we built a program basically to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to train students to do these things. So the program is built on uh, some uh, foundational things, right? Data science. So you need to understand where does data come from? How do you collect it? How do you process it? Then the next step is, well, once you've got this data and you understand it, what can we learn from this data? And you know, we say machine learning, but it could be analytics. It could be simple econometrics. But the point is we get data and then we need to process that data to turn it into something that's uh, actionable. Uh, and then on top of it is when we build on this, this is when we have financial technology, right? We've got some data. We've got something that helps us learn something from data. And then this together with, of course, us, the people that are involved in this, uh, gives us financial technology. So here's an example, right? So you could be working for a financial institution and someone asks you, well, what should we invest in? Or who should we lend to? And so that step is going to be a data science step, right? You sit down and you say, well, how many customers do we have? What kind of data do we have? Who do we not have as a customer? What kind of things do they want to borrow money for? Or what kind of firms could we be investing in? 
Uh, do we want to invest in public or private firms? And so you've got to collect this data, analyze this data, understand the data, and so you have an opportunity set. The next step is to say, well, you know, I'm a financial analyst. Why don't I calculate the risks and returns that are associated with these things? So the risks could be volatility if I'm talking about a public equity portfolio, or it could be the potential to not have our, our loan repaid if it was a loan. And then you look at the returns. Well, how much can I earn if I take this risk? And how much can I earn if I take a different risk, right? And this is where your financial training will come into, come into play. Well, machine learning can help you then to do this better, right? So instead of just having a person making ad hoc decisions, you might have a, a set of algorithms that collect data that you just can't, uh, that you just can't study sort of in real time. I can do it cheaper, right? If I do a first comb over of these things, then I let the machine learning algorithms learn deep, or I can let the machine learning algorithms pick out the most profitable opportunities, and then I can look at them all individually. Uh, and faster, right? And it could even be that machine learning and automation in general allows us to do the types of things that we do better, cheaper, and faster altogether. And so the combination is this automated technology supported decision making in a financial in a financial context. So notice I say automated and technology supported, right? We're still going to need people in there that walk a product, a decision, a firm, whatever it is, through all of the individual steps, through the data science, the data collection, the, and analyzing the risks and the returns, applying a model, right? You need to, if you're going to write a machine learning or an uh, analytics model, you have to understand the finance behind it and putting it all together into, uh, into a fintech. So in case it hasn't been clear or wasn't clear yet, it's about technology and finance, right? It's not about technology. It's not about finance. It's not about the or. It's about both of them. And it's about you or us or sort of the people involved in the, uh, in, in the, in the decision. So it's about data science, machine learning, and then being able to apply these things to loan pricing, derivatives trading, hedging, risk management, valuations, valuations sort of writ large, could be mergers and acquisitions, bonds, portfolios, real estates. So we've had a lot of conversations over the past couple of uh, past couple of months on these webinars, we've had people talk about the use of real estate, uh, the use of machine learning to price real estate. We had Jonathan Hunter on from RBC. We talked sort of about portfolios and trading. Uh, and then even really general things like uh, predicting macroeconomic trends, right? Anyone who's following the market right now knows that the big talk is like, is it transitory? Is it not transitory? Well, can machine learning help us understand some of these things? Maybe, maybe not. But trying to predict these things and coming up with better ways is certainly uh, a sort of a ripe avenue for use for these technologies. Um, the program structure in terms of the curriculum. Let me just do a quick check here. Roshan, are you uh, are you online? I am. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Excellent. Perfect. Why don't I just hand it right over to you at the uh, at the curriculum? Everyone, I'd like you to welcome a much more capable person than me to talk about the curriculum, Roshan. Thank you. Give me one. I'll stop sharing and you can just jump on with your share. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. See ya. I'll make sure you can share before I drop off. Yep. Okay. So the curriculum. So our students are going to be learning theory about financial innovation and technology, but we're also going to be providing students with that practical knowledge. How can we apply this in the real world, right? So the students will get extensive coverage of the fundamental mathematics and statistical theories and methods, but the focus will be as a practitioner, right? So a practitioner with a focus in technology. And our students will learn financial theory and how to apply real world decision-making. Our students will learn uh, how to Think about strategy. What does it mean to innovate in that intersection of financial technology and innovation? And so it's, it's not just about startups, but it's also about entrepreneurship. So innovating within the, the company that you're already in. And of course, there's a big piece on entrepreneurship and our students will take a course on, well, what does it mean to create a startup or to build a startup in the FinTech uh, or in the financial innovation area? And you'll work with teams, you'll acquire business acumen, you'll learn about analytics and how to develop analytical capabilities. You'll also learn about how to become a more 
comprehensive or steadfast leader in the field. And of course, you learn how to communicate more so within this area. And our students will be evaluated through exams, assignments, team projects, and presentations. So here's a snapshot of the courses that our students will take. So really and truly, it falls within two types of two categories. You can look at it in terms of the technical and financial courses. So creating new ventures and in financial innovation and technology, designing digital innovation, banking, dis banking disruptors. So similar to the topic of discussion that we had today, crypto economics and payments, digital capital markets, automated investing, financial data, privacy, and security. And of course, you'll have uh, team-based uh, project courses. All of our courses do have uh, a team-based component, but you will have that project course to work on as well. And you'll also learn about uh, corporate finance and financial statement analysis. In this day and age, um, and I'm sure many of you are aware of this, but you will be learn about, learning about AI ethics and policy. That is becoming increasingly more important as we realize some of the flaws with AI and machine learning that are um, happening right now, some of the flaws that are there right now that can be fixed and we have to take an ethical approach to it. We learn about acquisition and uh, managing data, introductions to analytical modeling, predictive modeling, and you also learn about machine learning and AI techniques. Uh, some of the programming languages and tools that our students will learn will be Python, SQL, R, SAS and Tableau. Um, it's not required that you have all of this information beforehand. And we do have this opportunity where you can learn about these programming lang languages through some offerings that we offer vis-a-vis uh, -vis Udemy. The program structure and schedule. Okay, so we're very close to starting right now. The program will be launching in November um, and it will be going until December of next year. Our students will have two residential sessions. The first one will be in November um, and the planning right now is to have it in Smith, Toronto, so downtown Toronto. And students will have an option to attend remotely. We will have another one in June um, in Kingston. So you'll have the feel for what it is to be at Smith, at Queens and in Kingston. Our students will have courses um, over, so there'll be a weeknight course and then you'll have weekend classes as well um, in Smith, Toronto or uh, if you want remotely. And our students will have asynchronous classes and self-study um, courses as well. As I mentioned, the residential sessions um, will take place in November and in June. So these are essentially week-long sessions. Um, and this is an opportunity for all of the students to come in, really immerse yourself within Smith, Toronto and um, at Goods Hall in Kingston. And you'll get that feel of being a full-time student. You'll be able to connect with your peers, with our administration and with our top-notch faculty. And of course, you'll attend engaging lectures in world-class learning facilities. So who are you going to be learning from? We have outstanding faculty and here's a snapshot of some of the uh, faculty members that you'll be learning from. We have Dr. Elspeth Murray, who is an associate professor and associate dean of our MBA and master's programs. She's also the director for the Center for Business Venturing and the CIBC fellow, uh, faculty fellow of entrepreneurship. Steve Thomas is the executive director of the Master of Management Analytics programs. He's also the executive director of the Master of Management in Artificial Intelligence program and is an adjunct assistant professor. Danette Perda is a professor in RBC Fellow of Finance. And lastly, we have Tina Dason, um, and she'll be teaching you things like business uh, AI and ethics. And she's a professor in Stephen J.R. Smith Chair of Strategy and Organizational Behavior. Um, we have a fantastic and well-renowned advisory board that helps us execute the program and really is our touch point for understanding what industry needs what does the financial innovation environment need right now? And they really advise us in how to move forward. And they're also here to have these conversations just as Rob Patterson had with us today. I won't read all of their names here, but this is a snapshot of some of the individuals who are working with us to really give you um, a stellar uh, education in financial innovation and technology. And some more um, really well-renowned folks such as Francisco Rivadeneria, and Larry Zalvin, Allison Wolf. Okay, so career management. Um, what, we, what we're going to be doing with you is we're going to 
have three stages in terms of helping you with your, with your career. So first, we're going to help you discover your strengths and what your career options are. So we'll have these tools in place to really figure out who you are, where you are right, right, at right now, and where you want to go. And so with that, we'll be able to help you build your skills and your personal brand. And thereafter, we'll help you launch your career with job searches, recruitment, onboarding, all of this stuff. Okay. We're also recognized by the Vector Institute, and we're recognized as delivering a curriculum that equips our students with the skills and competencies um, sought by industry, right? So we are trying to fill that gap, that gap that exists within finance and innovation. And so we are recognized by the Vector Institute of being, of being able to do something like that. And our students um, will be eligible or may be eligible for Vector scholarships in artificial intelligence in the upcoming year. And the nomination period will open January to March, 2022. Uh, specific dates will be um, made more firm later on. And of course, there are benefits for our students uh, given that we are recognized by the Vector Institute. So our students will have career pathways and projects in AI. We'll have tremendous networking opportunities. We'll be able to ex um, focus on recruitment events and activities that will help you find careers if you're trying to move into a different area. Um, and we also have uh, career support and activities with technical experts. Um, there are internship app, uh, programs for our students. And lastly, there's, our students can join the Vector Digital Talent Hub which is essentially a curated, a curated, uh, curated job board of AI career opportunities from internships to full-time, including restricted postings, exclusive only to members of the Vector community. Okay. We are um, an exclusive partner um, of the Canadian Olympic Committee, um, and we offer, our, we offer scholarships to cur current and former Canadian national team members um, and Olympic and Paralympic athletes across our professional graduate programs. So if you do come to our program, one of your classmates may be an Olympian or, a, or someone who is from the Paralympics, right? So that's, that's a great opportunity for you to learn from their experiences. And that really go, gets down to the heart of who we're trying to bring into our program. We're trying to bring an excellent student. So you'll be able to learn and work and collaborate with these very, very strong students that are coming into our program. Our alumni network is quite extensive and large. And you'll, here's a snapshot of what the profile looks like, uh, but you'll have an opportunity to connect with our alumni. Our alumni are very well tapped into, into our programs and with Smith. And so you'll have an opportunity to collect, uh, connect and learn with our alumni. So our current class profile for our MFIT program, which is, um, so they're, they're finishing up right now. We have 19 students in our first year program. Um, sorry, in, in the first integral program. Um, and the average age of our students is 33 years of age. They have about nine years of work experience. 26% um, of our class were, was female and 74% was male. We are, I am looking at the profile right now of our incoming class and it is starting to balance out more so. And as you can see, uh, we have individuals from Canada, um, China, India, Iran, uh, Nigeria and Pakistan, and we're hoping to bring in, diversify our student pool by bringing in more students from other countries. And you can see here that uh, we do have a lot of representation from different industries. So automotive, capital markets, consulting, energy, financial services, et cetera. So you can see the, di the, the diversity here, right? It's, it's beyond just finance, it's beyond just technology. It's really at the intersection of innovation and technology. All right, so if you're, if you're domestic students uh, entering the program, uh, the fees are 44,000 and change Canadian. And if you're an international student, it's 76,000 and change. And this really covers a wide variety of the fees. Uh, so it covers your tuition, your books, learning materials, meals and accommodations for when you're having the residential sessions here in, in Kingston or in Toronto. Um, and uh, you do have some options for, uh, for payments. Oh, there is also a deposit. And if you have questions about this, we can connect afterwards as well. Or you can also connect with an application advisor who will help you with your application. So once you um, connect, once you set something up, an advisor will provide you with an, a, a preliminary assessment and guide you through the process um, and really help you uh, develop a strong application to submit 
we do have a rolling admission. So as soon as right now, uh, we're getting very close to the program start. Um, we don't really have cutoff dates, but we are looking to wrap up our incoming class very soon because like I said, we are starting um, in about in less than two weeks. So if you want, if you have any questions, feel free to get in, in touch with us. You can email us at mfit at queensu.ca. I'm going to stop sharing here and see if there are any questions in the chat or in uh, the Q&A. Okay, I don't see any questions here right now. Maybe I'll give it a minute. Um, I'll, I'll drop my email here as well if there are any specific questions that you have um, and you want to follow with me, you can reach me here at roshan.fidit at queensu.ca. Um, alternatively, you can also start your application and an advisor will be more than happy to connect with you. I am seeing here um, that we have a few questions. So I'm going, we have an anonymous one. Um, which courses use R? Okay, so um, this, okay, I'm going to have to get back in touch with you about which courses use R specifically. Uh, so do let me get back in touch with you or you can email me and I can follow up with you on which courses really talk about the different programming languages that we'll be using. Uh, but really and truly, um, we, do, we do provide our students with an opportunity to learn about the different programming tools. So if you don't have um, knowledge of our programming tools that we're talking about, you will have an opportunity to learn beforehand. Yes, we're getting very close to, start, to the start date, but in a, in a real world, if you have the experience already, you should be fine. But I, I can certainly get back to you about which courses um, use R. I have a question here from uh, Patricio Gil Dubox. I apologize if I butchered your name. Are you able to provide some commentary about the joint MFIT, MVIM program would work? Currently enrolled in MFIT for context. Yeah, so I think this is something I would recommend getting in touch with an application advisor to see how that would work out for you. Uh, because you're going to be doing two programs simultaneously, um, you would, your the duration of you completing the program would would um, would be longer. Um, I would recommend reaching out to us and we can we can talk about what that would look like given where you are right now. If you are an MFIM program, if you are in the MFIM program right now. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Yep. So it looks like it's a predictive modeling course that uses R. Uh, we can certainly confirm that with you afterwards. Okay. I don't see any more questions, um, but I'm more than happy to touch base with you. Uh, my email is there in the chat. So if you do have any specific questions or do you want, if you do want to connect, feel free to reach out to me and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions and, and provide more information about the program. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining today. I hope you enjoyed the discussion and I hope this, uh, my first shot here about talking about our program was enough information for you to gauge at whether or not this is something of interest to you. If it is, feel free to start an application or reach out to us and we'll be more than happy to move forward from there. All right, thanks everyone, have a great day.